majorly on worldliness. I'll talk about what it is, what are the dangers of worldliness, what, is, what are the consequences, um, and then I'll talk about the cure, God willing, uh, as my time permits me. What is worldliness? By the world, I do not mean, or we do not mean the material world in the face of which we are living or moving. By the world, we do not mean your job or your school or your neighbor or your house. We do not mean that you cannot engage or deal with anyone in the society or engage in business in any way. When we say worldliness, we mean the system and the practice of the ungodly, the way of the ungodly. Worldliness, another way, can be called fleshiness. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, as described by the Apostle John in 1 John 2, verse 15. It is the kingdom of Satan ruling Better still, we can say, is the kingdom of the ungodly, where the ungodly reign. Someone said, it is where their minds prevail. It is where the ungodly and their ways of life prevail. J.C. Ralph, Ralph further uh, add, uh, added a few other thoughts to what worldliness is. And he said, when I speak of the world, I mean those people who think only or chiefly of these world's things and neglect the world to come. There are people who are always thinking of the earth more than heaven. People who are thinking of time more than eternity. People who are thinking more of their body more than their soul. People who are thinking of how to please man more than how to please God. These are people whose ways and habits and customs and opinion and practices and tastes, their aims, their spirits, their tone, all describe what worldliness is. And these are the people, the apostle said, come out from them and be separate. Worldliness is simply when the system of the world or the thinking pattern of the world dominates your life. And so, even though we are within the four walls, of this place. It is not necessarily this place. It is the system that rules this place. Whether we are talking about Nigeria or anywhere in the world. It is being friends with the world. It is being friends with those who are immersed in this system. It is to think and act and to be devoted to the world and its system and neglect spiritual and religious truth. It is to be more concerned with temporal things than eternal things. To be more concerned with self-pleasure in this life than meeting with God in the next life. That is worldliness. And uh, the psalmist in Psalm 17 verse 14 now describe the gatekeepers of this system. But it's not, it's not a computer. It's not AI. There are people behind it. In Psalm 17 verse 14, the psalmist said, with your, hand, with your hand from men, O Lord, from men from the world who have their portion in this life, and whose belly you fill with this hidden treasure, they are satisfied with children and leave the rest of their possession for their babes. The, 
and I just speak that part, you see these men, they are the gatekeepers. They are the, they are the ones who spew the evil in every aspect of life. They control the fashion of the world. They control the entertainment. They control the narrative around every area of life and even religious settings. They feed the system what it will produce. And if that system controls you, then you are worldly. If you follow their counsel, you are worldly. And their counsel is found everywhere. It is their counsel that makes up societies and cultures. Psalm 1, verse 1, the Bible says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. In summary, the psalmist does describe the system of the world. And if you really want to test it, you could pick one of these things and, and try and test it, because we're talking about discernment. Test it in any area of life. How do you know the system? How do you know that this system that you are up against is a worldly system? No. It is always hostile to godliness. Always hostile to godliness. So let's do a test. Let us see. Let us see if when we look at any area of life, we will see if there is the counsel of the ungodly there, if there is the ways of sinners there or the sort of discomfort. Let's speak worship. Yesterday I talked about worship. Let's speak worship and see if there's worldliness in worship. And I read to you Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 29 to 31. See if you can detect the system of the world as I read. When the Lord your God cut you off from before you, you, the nations which you would dispose, you, and you displace them and dwell in them, take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed bef from before you, and do not inquire after their gods, saying, How does this nation serve their gods? I also will do likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abomination to the Lord, which he hates, they have done to their gods. That is a signal of hostility to godliness. So when the Lord was saying, don't do what they are doing, don't, it is because, and again, they are hostile to me. Fashion of the world, dressing. Dominated by this system of the world. If you look at what the Bible says about how a woman should dress or a man, you will still see something about godliness or hostility to godliness. 1 Timothy 2 verse 9. In like manner also, the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pears or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. So when you will contrast how the women should dress, he added women that profess godliness, meaning every other thing that, will, that is contrary to that which is prof, that, prof, that professes godliness is of the world. And so you can go on and on to talk about this system. What about your speech? And so ask yourself, my dear friends, what about your speech? Is it in accordance with the system of the world? Is it hostile to godliness? What about your life decisions? Are you influenced? Are your life decisions influenced by the things of the world? Ask yourselves these questions. When you want to marry, what dominates your decision? When you are raising your children, what dominates that decision? 
how you spend your money. What is behind the model, the ideology behind what you are doing? How are you dealing or handling the pain in the land? Are you becoming more covetous? And you blame the pain in the land. Anything that you do that is hostile to godliness is worldly. Because the world is hostile to godliness. And this is the way to measure the world. And the dangers of the world, we cannot end today. Um, Horatus Bonner gave us the dangers of the world. And he took it from 1 John 2 verse 15. Love not the world, nor the things of the world. And so he said, and I will read maybe 10 or maybe 5. He said, why should I not love the world? When he read down the text, love not the world. He said, love not the world. Why? Because the gain of the world is the loss of your soul. Matthew 16, verse 25. Love not the world. Why? Because friendship with the world is enmity with God. Love not the world. Why? Because the world hates Christ. Love not the world. Why? Because Christ does not pray for the world. John 17, verse 9. Love not the world. Why? Because the prince of the world is Satan. He is the ruler of the system. Not creation. So when you hear that, it's the system. Love not the world. Why? Because it's condemned. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 32. Love not the world. Why? Because it killed the Lord. James 5 verse 6. Matthew 21 verse 39. Love not the world. Why? Because it is the seat of wickedness. And you can go on and on and on. The dangers of the world. And so when it comes to the world and worldliness, we need to run and sometimes we do not know the consequence of worldliness. Let me share with you two consequences of someone immersed in the world. Two. And I will borrow from Pastor Kalifungwa's message yesterday. The first one is, it brings dullness to the soul of man. Dullness. And yesterday he told us that we, you, will not, you are not able to digest the milk of the world, of, of the word, to make you grow. Because you are not growing. You are dull. You are not able to digest. So you, you, you cannot use what you have. But I'm going to pivot a bit and say, let me add to what he has said. When you are dull spiritually, and you are not able to grow, you, it will be perhaps that the thorns of the world are the one choking, stifling the root where nutrients are supposed to come. Where, when the world, you cannot take the world because the world has choked it out. Then before you know it, you start to wither and die away. In Luke 18, verse 14, the, that thought, the, fourth, the third soil, the, the, the seed that fell, fell among thorns, the Bible said, was choked with cares and riches and pleasures of lives and could not come to maturity. And this is very subtle. Because not everything in the world is sinful. But yet, they choke and stifle and destroy a believer. 
For instance, it is not unlawful to possess wealth and worldly substance. But they are needed for our well-being and even for the church. But when you set your heart on it and love it, you will grow soft and finicky and flamboyant and sometimes very careful, which in turn hinders your spiritual growth. You know, there are some spiritual characters that only come through suffering. But because you are now soft and delicate, you can't. Romans 5 verse 3 says, We glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance produces character. And character produces hope. And this hope will not disappoint because the love of God is poured in our hearts by his spirit. Meaning, the love of God is poured in our hearts by the Holy Spirit as a response to what he's doing in you. So when the trials come, he pours his love to make you persevere and grow in character and develop hope. But because you are soft, you are so delicate, you can't skip a meal. Before anything happens, you are, you, how will you get character? You love the world. And not only those who are rich, because I'm in Nigeria. Some are not rich, but they are looking forward to. They say, I cannot go and kill myself. You are as worldly as the man that has the money or the woman. Me, I no go suffer. How will you learn patience? Today I'm not spoken. I just want you to laugh. Eh? How will you learn patience? James chapter 1 verse 2 said, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into driver's trials, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You see why we lack everything? We can endure. And why can't we endure? We are worldly. You might be in one room and you are worldly. One room. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18, the apostle said, For our light affliction, which is for boy." For a moment, it's working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Why we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. But you see, all this one is gibberish if you are worldly. For if you are worldly, you won't see the things which are eternal. Teachers, those days, they say they have their reward in heaven. No more. worldly, you will never see the eternal weight of glory that the Lord is working in you through a particular trial. You compare yourself with yourself. You are not prepared for the things which are not seen. You are now Allah on go. You are not Suru Lele. I'm a Lagos boy, so I know all those things. Secondly, if you are worldly, you will be vulnerable. You will be vulnerable, and I hope I can spend some time here. As you grow attached to things in the world, we become vulnerable in our mind. And mind you, this has destroyed me all night because we are all in it. If you, are, if you are worldly, you become attached to things. You become exposed to the possibility of being attacked or harmed or physically or emotionally affected. Your heart becomes a sponge that soaks all manner of evil. You become an easy target for temptations. You'll be easily affected by the wiles and the schemes of the devil. Timothy said, those who desire to be rich they fall into temptations and snares 
You know why? Because they are, they are vulnerable. They are no more discerning. They just want to get it, even if it goes against the Lord. So he said, for the love of money is the root of all evil. The idea of that text is the vulnerability of the love of money. So he didn't tell you the evil. He says it's all evil because any evil can befall you if you love money. And it's worldliness. And he says some have strayed from the faith in greediness, pierced themselves through with many sorrow, pastors, selling anointing oil, selling, the, you see that it's not in the Bible, you do it, it is because you love the world. So what, when it's working for this person, you copy. You go to conferences and copy what the big man of God is doing. You have become vulnerable to all kind of evil. And you will soon stray farther than you can recover if you are not careful. But what about us, members of the church? You become anxious and prone to worry. Depression becomes the order of the day. Do you know what depression is? Unmet expectation. Say you know. That's it. When you have high hopes and expectations in life and God comes, because you were not there when he was planning the world, how will you say you know, tomorrow will be for you? Who told you? Do you know what he planned before the foundation of the world? And so he will do his plan, and you will not be depressed. You are vulnerable to the changes. Naira has crashed now. You are vulnerable to it. Band A, you are vulnerable. Yes, I live, I live in Nigeria. That's the problem. You are vulnerable. And many more will come. The earth is founded on sea, on the seas. The foundation of the earth is on the seas. You know what that means? But if you are not rooted in him, you will go to be tossed to and fro like babies. But the root is worldliness. So you are vulnerable in your mind. Panic attacks. Mental health, young people having issues. Things you hear with people of old age, you now see with young people. Students having diseases that are linked to worldliness. And then some of us start to go from one church to the other. You become easy prey. They go and promise you breakthroughs and deceive you. You wonder why people go to these crusades, even though these men have failed many times. Covetousness. And they know you are covetous. They know. So even when they give a false prophecy and does not come to pass, they will arrogantly bring the next flyer out. Some will apologize. Some will not. But you will come back. Because you are worldly. What is driving you is your greed. And this is why their shop never, they don't close shop. The Bible says, silly women, laden with sin, ever learning, never coming to understanding of the truth. If these women were not laden with sin, their eyes would open that, ah, this man is blind. How can someone say, I stake my anointing that this president will win, and the president did not win, and the next Sunday, everybody's in the church. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20, eh? Deuteronomy 18, verse 20, read it. If a prophet brings a prophecy that is wrong, he's stoned to death. Or the Bible says, do not be afraid of him. But because you are worldly, you will say, they will now say you don't have faith. They will blame you again. And we that don't take money from us, you would attack us. <laughs> but sincerely, this is true. The problem is us. Worldliness. The worst one is that you will start to attack the truth. Because you are worldly. It doesn't suit you. 
in Luke 16, verse 13 and 14, the Lord condemned Mammon. Look at what the Lord said. Luke 16, 13 and 14. He said, No servant can serve two masters, for either they will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and Mammon. Look at the next verse. Now, the Pharisees who were there, lovers of money, also had these things, and they derided him. They were angry because he said the truth. And the Bible qualified these Pharisees that they were lovers of money. And so they attacked the truth because they are covetous people. Because they know that if they follow the truth of Christ, their business center will shut down. But does that not describe you? I, why are you fighting the truth? For some of you, this is on Wednesday. Why are you fighting the truth? Is it because if you agree, it will take away your fame and fortune? Do you want to gain the world and lose the soul, your soul? Do you want to have a big church following, but in error and lose your soul? Why? My dear brothers and sisters, the consequence of worldliness, you cannot start. But then, how do you cure worldliness? Because that's why I'm here. It's tough. How do you cure worldliness? I read someone who said, we expel worldliness with a new affection. It is not enough to expose worldliness by just preaching and telling you the dangers and the consequences. It's not enough to discern what worldliness is. Something must be done about it. You can't destroy, someone said, you cannot destroy the love for the world merely by showing its emptiness. Even if we do, it will lead to more despair. Human nature requires an object of desire. You remove one affection by replacing it with another one. If you remove an affection and leave the place open, you know what the Lord said, you remove one demon, seven comes. Let's see if it's biblical. Ephesians 4, verse 17. You see the idea there, 17 and 18. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentile walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their hearts, who, being past feeling, have been given over to lewdness, to walk all on cleanness with greed, with greediness. So here we see that once a man is alienated or cut off from life of God, ignorance sets in. Blindness takes over the heart. And that prepares the heart of the man for what the Bible called all kinds of aff affection. And the word used there is lewdness. And all works of uncleanness. Do you know what lewdness is? Lewdness, lewdness is licentiousness. It means giving permission to do what you like. No holding back in the way you dress. Before the skirt was here. Now it's here. Now it's here. You keep going short, short before you're just naked. Is this, it is... God out, lewdness in. So you don't even know the extent of what you are going to do, but you have license. Until a stronger love comes in and compel your heart back. So how do you cure worldliness? It's not by shouting. It is the love of the Father. Man is not created to be a vacuum. 
We are created with the capacity of love, affectionate love. And we are always dominated by love, but it will be love of the world or love of the Father. You cannot have the two at once. You can only have one at a time. They don't mix. You can't be growing in holiness and godliness and yet growing in worldliness. No. The love of the world can only be expelled from our hearts with a new love. And that love is the affection and love for God, from God. The love of the world can only be driven out of our hearts by the love of the Father. So dear friends, what dominates your heart now? What dominates your heart? It's good to know so you can cry out for help. But sometimes, you know, it's good to discern the level of your worldliness so that you know how much you cry. Because you are covering your hair and you, you zip up, up to this point, it doesn't mean you are not worldly. It's in every area of our lives. Some people, their own have not broken out. It's still inside, incubated. The ones they have the opportunity, they will break out. So A.W. Pink gave four, st- four tests to see, to discern whether you are worldly. I will run through it quickly. Number one, he said, which do you seek excitement from or satisfaction from? The wealth and the honor of this world or the riches of grace and the appropriation of God? Which one are you, the, makes you satisfied the more? Which do you have great attraction for? The pleasures of this world that are bought for a season or the pleasures at God's right hand? Wherein lies your confidence? Is it in your money, your savings, or status in life or in the living and faithful God who promised to supply all your needs. See, some of you are troubled. You cannot sleep. You cannot, you think it, you are worldly. That, worldliness is the problem. What do you spend your money on? Personal comfort and luxuries? Or the circulation of God's word and the spread of the gospel. Where do you spend more of your money on? Lastly, what dominates your mind? Thoughts and schemes after worldly advancement or a resolution to grow in grace and knowledge of God? My dear brother and sister, are you trapped in the world? Discern for yourself if you are worldly. Even right now, some of you, your heart is not here. You know yourself. But I have good news. Even if you are trapped in the world, even if all of these four or five things describes you, Galatians 1 verse 4 said, Christ gave himself for us that he might deliver us from this present evil world. I have hope. Christ gave himself to deliver you from this present evil world. He died to free you from the grip of worldliness. And it is through him. There is no wisdom to navigate worldliness. It took the Son of God to die to deliver us from it. And so I will point you to him. He alone, because it is the very sign of your conversion. 
I don't care how much you say that you are a Christian. If you are worldly, if you are dominated with these worldly tendencies, you are not, you've not been delivered. If you go for those deliverance sessions and say they deliver you, what, ask the man, what have I been delivered from? You see, this present evil world that Christ died for, if you say yes, thank you. But it shouldn't be every Wednesday. But once. And when we maintain it by what Apostle John said in 1 John 2 verse 15, the love of the Father. He said, if these things are in you, these things are not the love of the Father. Meaning, he contrasts the love of the world and love of the Father. What then is love of the Father? How do you describe love of the Father? Who is the love of the Father? Because he is a man. He is God. He is a person. It's Christ. He came and said, I have come not to do my will. They offered him kingship. He said, he ran. Pilate told him, I can help you. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Christ is the love of the Father. His words, his commandment, his pattern, his spirit that he gives us. There's no other way to describe the love of the Father. No one has seen the Father except the Son. So the Son alone can tell us what and who and whatever it is that the love of the Father is. It is Christ that can show it to us. If you want your church to grow away from the world, present before them the love of the Father, His Son. This is my, my beloved Son. You know I'm well pleased. And let me be a bit more direct. One of the strands of worldliness that the apostle mentioned in 1 John is the pride of life. How can you dispel pride of life? Shouldn't it be Philippians 2 from verse 5 to 7? When we are told, let his mind that is in Christ be in you. And we are told of his humility. How even though he was God, he did not count the robbery to be God, but humbled himself to the level of a born servant unto when he's, he died on the cross. And if that mind is in you, how can the bread of life get to you? When the bread of life comes, you look to him to help you. And you look at him to be like him. He who created the world was put in a manger. He was taken away. He fled to Egypt. He was made to subject himself to Mary. What pride of life will remain in you if you are like him? They slapped him. The people he created slapped him. When he was reviled, he did not revile back. He kept on committing himself to he who judged righteously. He prayed. He's God, but he prayed. How can the pride of life get to you if this mind that was in Christ be you? So if life had beat you down, if you are shoved here and there, and your ego wants to swell up. You say, I'm, you don't know who I am. When you remember the Lord, you say, who, I, who, who you be? You tell yourself, who you be? Even if God has blessed you with wealth, before you show yourself, you say, what is this? You, you, the pride of life will just shut up. What about the lust of the flesh? Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 says, when you walk in the spirit and you are filled, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit. 
And that's a beautiful thing. It's it lost, yes, but the spirit will win. And the flesh will spill all its own, but the spirit comes with its fruit. And so if your mind is on the Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit is working in you, he will break the lust of the flesh. So he said, if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Another place he said, you are a child of God. My dear friends, the only way to navigate worldliness, because it's stronger than you, is our eyes on the love of the Father. Our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a pastor here and you do not preach Christ in your church, you are going to be judged. Because you are like the Pharisee who is not going to heaven, but also is blocking the door for other people. Because the only way they can break away is to point them to Christ. He will deal with the world in them. He will give them a new heart. He will give them his spirit. He will write on their heart his laws. Preach the Lord Jesus Christ. Preach continuously. Apply his words and his laws to the heart of your people. And worldliness will be subdued. There's no other way. There's no gimmick. Look at all the, those who walked faithfully. Their eyes were on him. Moses, we were told, looked at all that Egypt can offer. Looked at the people of God suffering. Where will he go? The Bible said he saw him who was invisible. And he followed. He would rather suffer with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin of Egypt. He didn't just wake up and did it. He saw him who was invisible. He saw the Lord. He saw a hope. He saw a promise. Joseph saw the same and said, take my bones along. Abraham said, I don't want any of your goods. He gave the kid of king of Sodom. Take. Don't say you bless me. And Hebrew said, he never, he didn't build anything in the house, in, in the, on the promised land. He sought a city. They all saw something. Beyond this world, Abraham only built altars and graveyard. Worship of God and burial ground. So those who are looking for Abraham's blessing, that's what you get. Are you not sons of Abraham? Follow your father. Except you are worldly. I want to follow him. I want to follow him. Altars. To worship him. Every opportunity to present my life as a living sacrifice. And then they bury me at last. But he saw something. The Lord said, Abraham was happy to see my day. Can't you see? Joshua saw him. He came, the commander of the host of heaven. Have you seen him? His name is called the love of the father. He will take you by your hand and walk you across this Jordan till you come to the father. He will fight for you. He will conquer every onslaught of the system. You can dominate this system. You can't before they are 10 steps ahead of us. You can't stop running around. Let us look for the love of the Father that we can be prepared for the eternal glory that Christ has prepared for us. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, it said, if you have been risen with Christ, let your heart, let, set your, your heart on the things above and not the things on earth. 
So when Christ come, he will come with your life. But if you are, your, your heart is set on this world, you'll be depressed, you have anxiety, you have panic attack. All these things will come. And yet, if you are not careful, you might just not be saved. My dear brothers and sisters, please look for the love of the Father. He's a man. He's called Jesus. May the Lord truly bless us. Amen.